Hello everyone, this is Ashutosh Pansal. Welcome to this webinar. Let me walk you through the inventory showcase flow in terms of uh, the topics we are looking to cover today. We have a packed agenda that I'm looking to cover in the next uh, 35 minutes or so. We will walk you through the supply network that we put together just for this webinar, all the master data that is going in with it. So you have a sense of uh, the data model and the product relationships the customer service that you're looking at. We will next go into a forecast error calculation process using a standard app with an IBP, so you understand how to generate error based on individual lag forecast, calculate and cap bias, look for intermittency, and so on. Next, we will go into a multi-echelon inventory optimization run, show you how the operator takes all the input variabilities into account to generate recommended safety stock. And then we will go into inventory plan analysis dashboards to understand the safety stock drivers, for example, or all the inventory components other than safety stock, things like pipeline or cycle stock and so on. We will also show you what kind of alerts can be generated, run a set of what if simulations, walk you through the process of overriding the inventory plan getting it approved by management, so you understand how planners retain control both on the input and the output sides of this engine. And also very importantly, we will cover demand-driven MRP topic. Uh, this is a separate planning area than uh, the area which is for multi-echelon inventory optimization. We are referring to it as MEIO versus DDMRP. In DDMRP planning area, we have the same supply chain model set up, so we will be able to compare uh, plan outputs across both approaches and walk you through concepts around buffer profiles and show you how demand-driven MRP generates uh, green, yellow, and red zones. So with that, let me just uh, launch into the showcase. So let me start the showcase by taking you through an input quality dashboard. And here's a dashboard tile. You're looking at the overall Fiori interface of SAP IBP. I just select my favorites to get to my dashboards easier. I've created an input quality dashboard here that I'm going to walk you through. Now you can see, just let's put this in perspective. So this is the network that we're looking at. And we have a North America centric uh, supply chain network. You can see there are several uh, DCs and plants here. So we have uh, manufacturing part of the network in Mexico. So we have suppliers and plants and a Mexico DC in Mexico City, DC1. We have a DC in Sacramento, DC2. We have a DC in Miami, DC3, and a DC in Toronto, Canada, DC4. So this is how we want to take care of uh, customers in Mexico directly from DC1, customers in US from DC2 and 3, and customers in Canada from DC4. If you look at this supply chain model, which talks about, and then let me just stress this for you so it becomes more readable. You can see how those same DCs, and we filtered this view for a single finished code FG1, we have more, but let's just look at it for one finished code. Finished code one is sold to customers in US, CG1 is customer group one, two, three, and four four different customer groups. You can think of them as segments, uh, online retailers versus brick and mortar retailers and so on. You have DC3 also shipping to one of the same customer group two that's buying from DC2 also. So both DC2 in Sacramento and DC3 in Miami are selling far as this customer group is concerned. We have Canada with its own set of customers coming from DC4, DC1, is selling to Mexico customers as well as taking care of demands in DC2, 3, and 4. So this is what we refer to as a hybrid node, where we have in DC1 independent demands from Mexico customers, as well as dependent demands from US and Canada. On the manufacturing side of the network, you can see the finished good one is built out of component four and an intermediate product called intermediate one, which has its own components. We are not showing them here. Those two things come together to form in two plants, plant one and plant two, the finished good one, which then proceeds to come into DC one. So hopefully this is clear. So let me take you back to the input dashboard. 
and we will go scroll down to see what else is here. You can see we have seasonal demand patterns in uh, the two finished goods that we are showing here, finished good one and finished good two. So if I were to explode this, so you can clearly see you are seeing data from week 30 of last year till week 30 of this year, uh, one year worth of data for finished good one, same also on finished good two. And you can see huge spikes and these are related to Easter, related to Valentine's Day and other uh, holidays and so on. But overall, a very random spiky kind of demand, uh, which is quite seasonal. So Finish good two is not as spiky, but it's also quite seasonal. So point we are trying to make is that we have built a rich data set across seasonal as well as intermittent demand. So let me show you an intermittent demand oriented view. If you were to look at intermittent demand view, you can see clearly we've got periods of sale where there is no sale being made. So this kind of demand pattern is also something IBP inventory can handle. If I further scroll down, you can see your dashboard can also report on forecast error CV. And in a second, we will look at this app in detail to say how is it calculating this. But on the dashboard, you can show where for a particular customer group segment and product location combination, you have high error CV. And error coefficient of variation is standard deviation divided by mean. So when you have a high number, that's telling you high variability, something for you to look into. Forecast by individual product in DCs is also something you can look at to make sure that you have received forecast properly. Keep in mind that this dashboard is created for the inventory planner to make sure all the inputs are in place and readiness to run inventory optimization is there. We will talk about this lag analysis when we look at the forecast error app. Let me park that for now. Some of the other inputs which are key are things like transportation lead time CV, the error in your inbound transportation as well as the lead times for the inbound transportation. You can see from DC1 in Mexico to 2, 3, and 4, you have different lead times. You have different lead time error also, depending on uh, when you're getting it from Mexico to Canada in DC4, you have a much higher overall error as compared to DC2 and 3. And last but not least, you have some uh, holding cost rate numbers where holding cost for inventory is very high in Sacramento in DC2 compared to Mexico. So when inventory optimization is running globally, it takes this into account to figure out where to optimally park safety stock. So as I mentioned while walking through the input quality dashboard that there is a lag analysis and a forecast error app. So let's go through that now. What you do is uh, you click on the Manage Forecast Error Calculations app to go in. You can see for GPI and the planning area we're using, uh, we have defined a profile here, so let's click on that. Now, let me just add it so I can show you some of the other parameters that go in. So of course, uh, you get to specify which key figures are uh, storing the forecast and actuals and so on. The historical horizon is important in calculating error measures. In, for example, I could just choose this to be instead of one of four, just 52 weeks, and you can see the horizon comes down to just 52 or if from an offset perspective. For whatever reason, we did not want to take the last eight weeks into account. You can see how it's uh, kind of reduced uh, those last eight weeks out of the overall 104 weeks of history that we have. Let's uh, reset these back to the values that we had before. So if we scroll down, you can see we're using from an error measure perspective, provision of variation CV. This is uh, your standard deviation divided by mean over the historical horizon. If you scroll further down, you can also use this app to calculate the bias and also provide a cap, in which case uh, the bias used by the inventory optimization operator would be different from the bias calculated. You can also define uh, caps on the CV to say no more than uh, 2.5 value of the CV is to be taken. So we are not going to go through each and every choice uh, here, but I do want to highlight some of the ones which are key. So you can choose to adjust bias, as I said before. And for example, if we choose the maximum positive bias value to be 0 0.20, we are telling the app anytime it calculates the bias to be more than 0.25, it should 
show that in the calculated bias key figure, but for the bias being used, that would be capped at 0 0.20. You do have options to say whether you want to cap for positive or negative bias. And let me now take you through the picture I was showing you before, the lagged analysis, and then we will go see this in Excel. So we have uh, loaded uh, individual lag one, lag two, lag three forecasts and compared them against sales. So you can see how these are moving. You can see how the individual can, and you can, for example, look at any one area and start zooming in. To see exactly how these things are trending. And this allows you to see how all the individual forecasts for lag one, two, and three have been moving along. In, in this case, we see that they are largely moving in sync, and, and it seems like a good pattern, but sometimes you will see a crisscross happening. So uh, it, all of this gets fed into calculating like specific uh, CV error by the uh, forecast error operator. And based on that, you can then average those uh, error lags and use the forecast error CV in the inventory optimization. So let me just show you in Excel how this all comes together. So I'm going to run the forecast error operator, which is you just come to run. So we'll run the intermittent demand one that I've shown you before on the base version. And this job has been scheduled. And all we have to do is in parallel go and restrict some of the data so it becomes easier to understand by coming in and choosing intermittent and demand bias, filter that I define. And if I now go, you can, for example, see for DC4 and for FG3 across customer groups, how the RFCV has been loaded and how the bias is being calculated. So if I can show you, this is the bias being calculated. And when it is uh, more than 20%, obviously the bias is being kept. So this is the bias that will be used. If you scroll down and see in cases where the bias was less than 20%, that is indeed the bias. So hopefully that makes sense. You can understand how the historical bias as well as the historical error is being calculated. You also have the option of loading it. So for example, the error is being calculated as 0 0.90. You could also load it in uh, terms of calculating it outside and bringing it in, in which case the system is going to consider what you load as opposed to what it can. So now that we have seen the forecast error at and we are familiar with the supply chain model, let's actually go through and run the global inventory optimization operator and some of the follow-on operators around calculating inventory target components, calculating loss demand, et cetera. I want you to see that we have only filtered out and then we are going to do this only for DC2 and FC1, but the operator would run globally. We'll see it only for that combination and all the four customer groups that buy from that uh, Sacramento DC, the finished good one. So right now you can see recommended safety stock and uh, IO safety uh, stock in days is blank. I'm gonna go and run a job that allows me to, and just so you understand how this is done, if you search on application jobs, you will see there's a tile for application jobs. You click on that, click on the plus sign to get a job started. I have defined this as GP inventory consolidated run. So that's the one I'm going to choose. And now if you scroll down and see there are three steps that are combined in this consolidated run. And we can see what those individual three steps are. The operator happens to be different in each step. So you can see it's operator 1003, uh, 003 for global multi-state inventory optimization. And then if you notice, uh, calculate target inventory components is six, loss demand is four, and six and four are the ones being used in step two and step three, respectively. So I'm just gonna go ahead and schedule this job. And this helps me, I could have also in Excel gone here, if I go back to the IBP view, 
I could have just gone here and run. And, and when you're running it, you do get the option. So when you're running it, you do get the option of uh, choosing whether you want to run global, and then you have to come back and do calculated target inventory components, and then come back and do loss demand if that's what you want to see. Uh, and, and this just consolidated in the back end allows you to get through all of that. But the option exists to do it in Excel. So given I just ran the job, let's just see, refresh the data and see if uh, this is going to now show me recommended safety stock. As you can see, they're now showing me the stock that it has calculated and number of days that that translates to from a demand coverage perspective. Now, this is fairly intuitive. What I want to do is also show you the impact individual input parameters have on the output that you're getting, which is the safety stock. So for example, I can uh, change uh, things like transportation lead time or period between replenishment or target service level. So we will just start out uh, saving all of these changes in a scenario. So before we show you how we can simulate the output of the inventory operator, change the input parameters and so on, let's just first evaluate the quality of the output in the baseline version that we did get. So as you can see, there is a plan quality dashboard I've created. I'm just going to click on that. And once this loads, uh, just to make this easier, let me go one by one. So you can see this is safety stock analysis. What we're seeing is for three finished goods, that's G1, 2, and 3, we want to understand how the overall safety stock, which is shown as the blue pillar here, is broken out by the individual. And you can see the demand variability, which is 71, the supply variability, which is 6, and the service variability, which is 21. So those three values. And this is a way to understand that when you're looking at a safety stock, large part of that safety stock is because of forecast error, not because of your transportation lead time or production lead time error. This number is less when you're looking at FC2, so that tells you FC2 is doing better overall uh, forecasting performance-wise. And it, this is just a way to understand the drivers behind your safety stock. Let me take another one here. This is an inventory component analysis. So along with safety stock, which is in green. You're also looking at how much pipeline stock, which is inventory in transit or in process, and how much cycle stock, which is to cover the demand between uh, two periods of replenishment. And this is another neat way to understand product by product. When you're looking at overall inventory for that product in the supply chain, where is that coming from? As you can see, FT, and, and this has all been done for FT1 across all the locations in the supply chain, so DC1, 2, 3, and so on. You can see that C1 safety stock as a percent of overall inventory is lower in DC1, which is Mexico City, as compared to DC2, which is Sacramento, as compared to DC3, which is Miami, or DC4, which is Canada. So the variability and error in these customer-facing nodes is higher, and as a result, safety stock as a percentage of inventory in those DCs is higher. These are good insights. You might say why we are not seeing a value here for FG1 and plant one. And the reason is plant one happens to be co-located with the DC1 in Mexico City. And we have set the stock type to be a non-stocking node for FG1. So it's not going to store any inventory once the plant makes finished good one, it immediately moves it to the DC1. So that's why there's no inventory for FG1 in plant one. FG1 in plant two is an interesting story. Also, you can see that it's got a cycle stock in terms of whatever it's making, but there is no safety stock. The plant's not required to carry any safety stock. It's relying on the DC1 to manage all that safety stock. So this is another insight into how both your uh, safety stock drivers are and how individual inventory buckets are. If you go further down, you can see a cost view of it. So if we are looking at safety stock value in dollar terms, this allows me to see how that safety stock investment is by location. And this is across all finished goods here, looking at it for a given week only. But this allows you to see that you're carrying way more safety stock overall from a dollar perspective in your DC4, which is Canada, turn to DC, as compared to some of the others. 
And this is a direct uh, result of the intermittent demand pattern that we've seen in Canada, and also the delays uh, from sending from Mexico City into Toronto. This is another take uh, inventory safety shop investment by product, and this allows you to see the same picture, but this time by product. So you can also see across my entire supply chain how much safety stock is invested for FC1 versus 2. And if you see problem products, that's when you start going down and saying, why have I got so much for FC3 versus 1? I will talk about this in a second, but this is another point I want to talk about, the reorder point. Uh, it's something that inventory optimizer outputs along with target inventory, position, along with recommended safety stock, pipeline, and cycle stock, it also tells you the point at which you should optimally reorder. You can also have, uh, you see they're shown here, you can also have uh, views where you say, okay, if I have a minimum and a maximum safety stock days guideline, and, and that is set as 10 days for minimum and 60 for maximum, you're now saying across individual uh, finished good uh, locations and across uh, so across finished goods and across locations, where do I have cases where my safety days is higher than the norm, which is the maximum? So these are places to look for to say the demand variability is definitely out of control here. We have 85 days of uh, safety stock sitting and in some other cases. So let me show you how the safety stock is related alert that we were seeing in the dashboard. You can also see that the proper alert coming out to you. So if you notice, uh, we are seeing an 85-day picture, 85 days against the maximum 60, and several other alerts exist. Go to monitor customer alert. And this monitor customer alerts, I can then scroll down, and I see I've defined a inventory safety stock days related alert. And if I scroll down, if you see DC4, FC3, seven alerts happen to be there across different weeks. So seven of the weeks, starting from week 21 and, and some of the weeks, there has been a problem with the maximum 60. And you can see right here that value of 85 that we were seeing on the dashboard is also captured in the alert. So obviously there is a further detail behind this to say how do you set this up, how do you subscribe and all of that. We can cover all that today. Let me just take you back now to the simulations of the output uh, by changing the inputs in the Excel UI. So in order to show you how you can run water simulations and scenarios within inventory in IVP, we will take a scenario approach of uh, the baseline is where we calculated the global inventory fall. We are going to play with the transportation CV values and, and see what the impact is. So right now, as you can see, there are three scenarios I have, lower transportation CV, higher, and baseline. Obviously, there are no answers or recommended safety stock in those two scenarios because we haven't run it yet. But if you notice the baseline value of transportation lead time at a CV is 0.25 in all weeks, I'm going to take a scenario where I say, what if I was able to get a better alternative uh, transportation option where the CV reduces significantly 0.1. And flip side, what if uh, I go with another provider where the CV is very high, but I pay much lower and I will play with a very high value of CV 0.9. And let me just stretch this value across all the buckets. And the last one is a total or an average, so I'm not touching that. But now that I have this, I'm just going to save data. And I'm going to then run the inventory optimization. So if I am running it, I'm running it for higher and lower transportation CV along with the baseline. And I'm running the global inventory fault. And I hit run. So if I look at the status of the job that I just ran, I can see that the job is already finished. And you can see how when you have a much lower transportation CV of 0.1 compared to the 0.25, the recommended stock has come down compared to the baseline, right? From 103, 105, we have seen numbers like 85 and 99. 
On the flip side, when you have high transpiration CV of 0.9, you see the disproportionate increase in safety stock is pretty much almost doubled. So as you have higher supply variability coming in, uh, you see much higher safety stock numbers. And if you were to look at your dashboard on the uh, safety driver in terms of demand versus supply variability, you will see a much higher proportion of the supply variability into that safety. So here is a view of the same uh, simulation. You can see we have uh, a twin uh, y-axis here. You have transportation lead time error CV on this side and then a recommended safety stock. So you're seeing the safety stock values in sync with the high CV. So when, and, and these are, you're seeing these things in three individual weeks. So if you just focus on one, week 21, which is the current week, you can clearly see how the safety stock recommended is in sync with the high transportation error CV in terms of the lead time error. If you look at the baseline version when we had 0.25, this is the value we were getting in baseline. If you look at the lower transport CV version, your CV comes down, but it goes up quite appreciably in terms of uh, the recommended safety stock required when your CV goes up. So please this gives you a picture of the what is simulation capability? Obviously, you could run similar scenarios on anything, including period between replenishment or target service level, anything upstream, production lot sizes, et cetera. It's all open to evaluating alternative suppliers, alternative production processes, alternative demand error statement to see the sensitivity analysis, the value of making a change to your overall safety stock. So let me show you how the process works for overriding the inventory plan and approving the plan from a management perspective. So as you can see for DC4, FC3 combination, we've got recommended safety stock as calculated by the system. We are also showing the safety stock days. Remember this 85, uh, that was showing up as an alert. Obviously the planner catches it. The planner doesn't like this. Planner would like to bring it down. Let's say we want to go with 100K. The planner also notices that this is 70 uh, higher than the 60 limit and the planner wants to further control this to 70K. And let's just say that the planner is also looking at some numbers here, which is 68 is higher and is looking to bring this down to 95. Okay, so I made three changes, 170 and 95, and I'm gonna save. And now let's move to a inventory plan approval view, which in the real world uh, would not be a tab available to the planner. The manager logs in, they will have this tab. They will have these additional key figures, inventory manager, override approval, and alert. And you can notice how when I made changes uh, through this flag, I'm able to highlight the manager's attention and say here is where you see the planner has made some changes. Those things have come across in your key figure as well. But if you don't approve, so for example, I might say I'm okay with these two, but I am not comfortable with this particular change. I could go back and take the original recommended safety stock and go ahead and make the same. So in the end, we could set up a process where what's in the inventory manager override approval is going into the final recommended safety stock. So you can see when the manager approved uh, the changes proposed by the planner, it is the changes the planner set here, but when the manager did not approve, it is the recommended safety stock that's coming into the final recommended. And we could say the final recommended safety stock is the value now being sent to your ERP system for execution purpose. So hopefully this makes it clear. So we are gonna to go to the DDMRP planning area and see how for the same exact supply chain network and master data set, what kind of recommendations for safety stock do we get from the DDMRP side. So now that we have seen how MEIO works, let's focus on DDMRP. You're looking at an Excel view where we are analyzing both the inputs and the outputs related to DDMRP operators. We pull the data at a location product level, so you can see DC2, FG2. Some of the parameters are similar to the MEIO site, uh, the multi echelon inventory optimization, uh, that you saw before, period between replenishment, how often uh, you take time decisions, lead time transportation, the error in that lead time, minimum lot size, and so on. Now, 
interesting thing now is that you have in a concept in DDMRP called heat coupling point. Uh, Chad talked about that earlier. The planning operator for calculating decoupling point puts a value whether it's zero or one. One tells you that the system is going to decouple, meaning it's going to put a buffer here. Zero means it's not going to do that. So let's just go ahead and run the inventory optimization, DDMRP solver for recommending uh, decoupling points, just so you can see how this is done. I go ahead and I run it. And if I look at it, now it's uh, finished. So I will refresh the data. And given I just sent it, nothing should change, but hopefully this gives you a sense of it's a live system. And based on the decoupling is even, it's calculating decouple lead time, how much uh, the lead time will be. And because of the two week lead time from DC1 uh, to ship it to DC2, it's come up with two week lead time. Average usage is the forecast going forward. Um, there were actuals in the past also that we loaded, you're just not seeing them because it's a feature uh, period oriented view. Demand adjustment factor, we'll come to that in a second. But let's just go and look at these concepts of red zone base, red zone safety, yellow zone, and green zone. I want to focus on how these are calculated. So let's just quickly walk through some calculations. I'm not going to go through all these calculations, but uh, hopefully this allows you to see all the inputs that are going in, all the outputs in terms of how the red zone base and safety and yellow zone and green zone are calculated based on propagated average daily usage, which is the forward looking uh, demand and uh, the decoupled lead time that the system's calculated. The lead time factor and the variability factor are two things that are coming from the buffer profile and this is part of master data which you maintain. So you're essentially saying uh, for high variability or high lead time or low variability and high lead time, what kind of factors do you want to assign which uh, increase or decrease the size of these zones? All these calculations are listed here. This is being recorded, so you can always come back and take a look at these calculations. It's important to understand that once you have these red zones, the base and safety come together to calculate a top of red. Uh, yellow zone is added to that top of red to get to a top of yellow, and so on to top of green. You can see the same values here, and the idea is that based on, on the demand here, average usage is a little bit different, so you'll get different numbers. But we are able to calculate in the system the base as well as the tops. Now let's go ahead and do some simulations around this. So I'm going to pull up a situation where we look at what is for the minimum uh, lot size that we have was different. We started out saying there is uh, no minimum lot size, as you can see. Uh, minimum lot size transportation is zero. I'm going to pull up a scenario that I've uh, set up. So let's just go ahead in the transport minimum, we are going to put a minimum lot size of 40,000. Let's say that's our, and, and let's just make sure we understand what the recommended zone sizes are. So we are seeing the green zone is somewhere around 25 to 35. So I'm going to set it at uh, 25,000 so you can see. So let's go ahead and make it 25,000. And notice I'm only doing this for the transport minimum scenario, not in the baseline. So I'm going to save this. And I'm going to go ahead and run the operator one more time. I'm going to this time also run it on the transport minimum scenario along with the baseline. Well, in fact, the baseline is already there. So let me, in the speed of things, just only run it on the transport minimum. You can see it's already finished. So we'll go ahead and refresh the data. And if now you understand the minimum order quantity, you're seeing a 25,000 value maintained based on what I entered before. If you go to the green zone, you can see whenever the number is less than 25,000, as you can see in the baseline scenario, in our transfer minimum scenario, the green zone 
So if you remember the calculation for green zone, it is max of minimum order quantity and other things. And when the minimum order quantity is the maximum value, it's going to make the green zone equal to the minimum order quantity. So you can see this effect here that when minimum order quantity based on the transportation lot size is higher than all the other components, that is the value you get. When it is higher, you get 25. When it's not, you get the other components driving the definition on green. So hopefully this is clear. So you can see for DC2, SG2 combination across a range of weeks, the top of red, top of yellow, and top of green are coming out in sync with the numbers that we see. So if you look at the numbers here, 45, 93, and 121, those are the numbers that you see here. So the graph is based on the numbers we just calculated. So we've also loaded uh, the DDMRP outputs into the MEIO oriented in uh, planning area just to see how uh, the two recommendations compare against each other and they're not apples to apples strictly, but we compare target inventory position that the multi echelon inventory optimization side is solved for, uh, which is recommended uh, safety stock plus pipeline plus cycle and, and compared with the top of green zone that we got from DDMRP. And you're seeing this analysis done across three weeks, week 22, 23, and 24. And this is for all the four DCs, DC 1, 2, 3, and 4, and only for finished good 2. So we have, as you can see, pretty identical numbers in most of the cases. But in some cases, you can see also uh, the differences are pretty stark. And it'll be interesting uh, to deep dive and do that analysis. Uh, but uh, we just wanted to give you a flavor for how these two solutions compared to each other. So this is all I had for uh, the inventory showcase. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I'm going to give it back.